Hello, I'm Darlene Frank, Vice President of the San Francisco Peninsula Branch of the California Writers Club. We're sitting in the home of James Hanna near San Francisco, and as a writer who enjoys talking with other writers about their work, I'm really delighted to be talking with James about his novel, The Siege, his new novel, The Siege, which has just been released by Sand Hill Review Press. Um, James, congratulations on The Siege, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much to talk about your book today. Um, James's short stories have appeared in more than a dozen literary journals and three have received pushcart nominations. James also wandered Australia for seven years before he settled on a career in criminal justice. He spent 20 years as a counselor in the Indiana Department of Corrections and he recently retired from the San Francisco Probation Department where he was assigned to a domestic violence and stalking unit. Never a dull moment, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And so it's fitting that he would write a novel about a hostage standoff in a prison. So tell us briefly about your book, James. I'm going to read the blurb because I think that uh, encapsulates it best. 100 inmates hold 12 guards hostage in the laundry dorm of the Indiana Penal Farm. Emergency squads are massed along the fence, awaiting the order to attack while sharpshooters are perched like crows on top of the administration building. Tom Hemmings, a dorm counselor, has been conscripted to defuse the standoff. But the inmates are divided into rival gangs, the guards, into feuding unions. And the prison administration has sparked the standoff by forcing cut-rate services upon the facility. As he enters the prison, Tom's heart starts to hammer. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad? And how will those will this nightmare end? Look into the void, and the void will look into you. These are the terms under which Tom Hemmings must negotiate the siege. All and right. so we have one man's descent into darkness. Well, the, the, the siege was clearly written by somebody who is an insider to the prison system. Um, why did you write this story? To depict the plight of people working in penal facilities. I also wrote it as a metaphor for modern times. Uh, we see similar factionalism across the country today. Um, the Tea Party movement on the right and the Occupy movements on the left. So I think it uh, serves also as a uh, contemporary metaphor on top of being um, a prison story, a rousing prison story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there some particular incident or event that inspired this book? The um, trigger came when the um, facility uh, contracted with privateers who brought cut rate services uh, at uh, exorbitant costs um, to the facility and dumped these services upon the inmates and uh, created a kind of a siege mentality uh, among the guards and the inmates. I got to thinking... Um, this act that actually, that incident you just described actually happened yes. where you were working? Yes. We never uh, experienced a riot and a hostage standoff, but I think the reason for that was because the inmates didn't have the leadership. So I was wondering what would have happened if the inmates had two great leaders. So uh, I put uh, together um, two very charismatic, charismatic leaders in Chester Mahoney and Hamal Hassan. And uh, this created uh, something which I think could have very easily have happened had the leadership been there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was inspired by an actual incident. Have you ever yes. been involved in a, a life-threatening incident in prison? I've been close, but uh, you learn to develop your interpersonal skills. Um, the way you treat inmates mm -hmm. is your best source of defense. Because if the shit hits the fan, if the right comes down, your best source of defense will be the inmates. Mm -hmm. I think you're expendable to staff, but the mm -hmm. inmates if they like you, would be your best source of defense. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of leads me to the, the next question, which is um, your main character, Tom Hemmings, um, develops or has developed a sort of friendship, or let's say he feels an affection for um, one of the child, um, Chester Mahoney, who is a child molester. He's in prison for child molestation. He's also a backwoods preacher. And um, I'm, I was wondering how common are friendships uh, between prisoners and staff, and how does this happen? They're common because um, 
prisons aren't divided between staff members and inmates strictly. Um, they're also individuals, and individuals form uh, friendships very, very spontaneously. In the case of this book, um, Chester and Tom Hemmings um, share very common backgrounds. Both are highly literate, both love Shakespeare, and uh, both have anti-government mentalities. Tom was forged during the uh, Vietnam era when he de developed a profound distrust of government. Chester was formed when uh, changing economics caused him to lose his job and also his farm. So he became the leader of the American Gospel Party, uh, a, a strong anti-government sect in um, backwoods Indiana. So their commonalities brought them together. Their commonalities were very profound. Is there something called the American Gospel Party, or is that a fictionalized uh, party? I made it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it sounds like it could be But uh, a lot of rebellion is sanctified by pseudo-religion. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you tell the story of how Tom Hemmings, when he was a new counselor at the prison, lost his innocence during a manhunt with a prison guard who seems to enjoy killing people. Um, since Tom seems in part based on your own experience through some other references in the book, for example, he writes killer memos, which I think you probably did, um, I'm wondering how does his loss of innocence parallel your own when you first began working as a counselor? I wasn't in a manhunt in which an inmate was shot dead and I had to keep my mouth shut. But I lost my innocence in other ways. Uh, I expected to be supported by the uh, prison when I started off as a counselor, but I wasn't. Training was superficial. Uh, the self-defense de tactics they teach you, um, they're not enough, and I think they teach you these tactics mostly to avoid liability if you get hurt. Rules are ever-changing, arbitrarily interpreted, and can be subjectively applied if somebody doesn't like you. Also, there's a kind of staff member uh, with very low ego strength who will snitch you out in a second for the most petty of matters if they think it will advance them in the eyes of management. So I did develop um, an anger working in prison. And um, I fought back at times. Uh, I became known as kind of a maverick. So it was a gradual loss of innocence rather than a particular incident where you just kind of like were shockingly um, surprised. Yes, and um, there's a line in Orange and the New Black, is the New Black, that says it very well. The worst thing about prison is chicken shit rules enforced by chicken shit people. <laughs> and that's what, that's what grinds you down, that's what shrinks your soul, mm -hmm. unless you choose to fight back. Um, one thing that really struck me was in the book was the language, the poetic, flowery language that Chester Mahoney and sometimes Hassan use. Um, and I, this is not language you'd expect in a prison, and I wondered whether you have known inmates who really talk like this, or, or what was your intent here as a writer to incorporate this style? My intent was to make the characters larger than life. Everyday language uh, isn't really very good when you're writing a novel. It's kind of boring. So I wanted to elevate the characters to a higher level. So um, Chester Mahoney, as a Shakespeare aficionado, will let the bard drift into his dialogue now and then. There are many examples of um, characters who are made larger than life through, through dialogue. Wolf Larson in The Sea Wolf uh, is a thug and a brute, but he's also highly well read and um, he defends uh, his uh, barbarity very eloquently. Uh, another example would be Don Quixote. He's highly eloquent. One of the characters describes him as either the maddest wise man or the wisest madman he has ever met. The Frankenstein monster is not the uh, lumbering thug that Hollywood turned him into. He's a childlike creature with an inquiring mind uh, who is very eloquent when he describes his trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. So. To elevate characters, I think you also have to elevate language, at least with some of the characters, because that was, that's what keeps them memorable. Mm -hmm. You don't want stereotypical characters that uh, people forget about as soon as they put down the book. Okay. Um, 
You told me once what your wife said to you when you uh, asked her about the characters, the novel's characters as you were developing them. Um, and it, it, it somehow inspired you to keep going. Can you yes. tell that story again or just tell me what she said? Yes, I was running my characters by her. So I asked her one day, Mary, what do you think of old Chester? You like him? And she says, no, I don't. I said, how come? And she said, uh, because he's a bullshitter and a pervert. Said, oh, well, how do you like Sarah Bumgarner, who becomes Tom's love interest? I don't. How come? She's a foul-mouthed slut. Oh, well, do you like uh, Tom Hemmings? No, I don't like Tom Hemmings either. He's a misogynistic playboy, and he should be locked up with the rest of the inmates. So Mary did not like the characters, but she was reacting to them as if they were real people. So I said, keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. If people react that strongly to the characters, you've, you've got something going. Yeah, and I had a similar reaction when I read the book. I mean, I wasn't fond of the characters. Um, and I think from your reviews, too, you get people really resonating, or not resonating, but they, they are provoking a response in readers. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you spent 34 years in criminal justice. Uh, after your 20 years in Indiana, you uh, spent the rest of the time in the domestic violence and stalking units in San Francisco. Um, you mo when you walk down the street, I'm sure you see things that the rest of us don't see. What, what, how, does, how do you perceive the world because of your experience in prison work, in prison, criminal justice work? You realize that crime is faceless and it transcends every social strata. I had uh, doctors, lawyers, even a parole officer on my caseload. These are everyday pro-social people, just like you and me. But they have addictions that desensitize them to the consequences of their behavior, and therefore they end up on my, on my caseload. What you realize when you've been in criminal justice long enough is that uh, anybody under certain circumstances can commit a crime. So when you walk down the street, you kind of see, okay, that guy, that, she, that person could be, you sure. know, you just, it could be anyone really is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't make them bad people. Uh, a lot of probationers have great strengths as well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering kind of the opposite side of that question. What, um, in what way were you suited to this work? You stayed in this career a long time. What did you like about it? What, what gifts did it give you? I'm an adventure junkie. I like a raw edge to life. That's why I spent uh, seven years in Australia, most of it in the mm -hmm. northern outback. Um, so I like the excitement of it. And also, I'm uh, almost altruistic to a fault. I feel a responsibility for other people. Uh, I feel a desire to help other people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very rewarding in uh, the insights and the help I was able to bring to the lives of other people. That's wonderful to hear that, and I think that it, it's probably easy for um, prison workers to um, develop a callousness, callousness or a hardness, but if you're going to stay in it long term, it seems like there has to be a way. You have to have that, that feeling of compassion and altruism. Um, that still has to be alive in you, or you wouldn't stay in the career for a long time. That's true. And also, uh, the callousness is uh, rarely developed towards the inmates. Mm -hmm. Because uh, almost all the time the frustrations uh, come from staff, from their arbitrary interpretation of rules, from the people they contract services from. Mm -hmm. Even the unions can be frustrating because they spend so much time fighting among each other um, that they're not going to give you big, uh, good backup if the shit hits the fan. So um, most of the frustration does come from the staff. And uh, officers cope with it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some of them become alcoholics, uh, in which case their lifespan is going to be about 55. Some uh, develop balanced lives. And s some, like me, fought back. I was, I was pretty good with killer memos. And after a while, the word got to be, don't mess with Mr. Hanna, because he'll take you to the appeals commission and maybe arbitration. That word there was um, a price to pay. I was never going to be promoted to the point where I was in the inner clubhouse of the administration. Mm -hmm. But that's not a club that I really wanted to belong to anyway. 
Yeah, I can hear that from your <laughs> earlier answers. Um, how is the siege similar to or different from other prison novels? It's similar in that it deals with intrigue, it deals, it deals with uh, corruption, and it comes to a climactic, uh, bloody end. It differs in that I didn't want my characters to be stereotypes. Each character has strengths and weaknesses. Each character has a kind of legitimacy about him. But it's the legitimacy, uh, paradoxically, that does lead to the conflict, that does lead to the standoff. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah Bumgardner, one of my favorite characters in the book, sums it up rather well in a statement to Tom Hemmings. After he calls her petty, she responds, I'd rather be petty, if that's what you want to call it. The whole problem here, in case you haven't noticed, is that everybody has a damn good reason for what he's doing. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a question about the structure of the novel. It's in short chapters that are titled with the date and time, like November 24th, 2009 a.m. It's almost like a log. And in the first part of the book, you really rely on flashbacks to provide mm -hmm. some important backstory on the key characters. How did you decide on the structure of the novel? Uh, the early structure was uh, determined by Tori Hartman, my publisher. Uh, she figured I needed to get some more attention into the earlier pages. And that worked really well. We used the format similar to what they use in um, Law and Order, um, where uh, the story is slowly developed through, through flashbacks. Um, Einar Folsing, um, whose uh, book, A Knavish Piece of Work, I would recommend, uh, was really complimentary of the flashbacks. He said, it's like watching the present and the past on a collision course, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. Um, you wrote most of this novel while you were still working full time. Um, where did you find the time and the emotional energy left over at the end of each day to write? My compulsion to write the book was so strong that I preferred sleep deprivation to the <laughs> constipation I would have felt had I not written the book. The book just came charging down on top of me and demanded to be written. The characters swarmed upon me like riled off, riled up strangers demanding to be heard. I wrote it because I had to write it. Mm -hmm. And I stole time wherever I could to write it. And I was leery eyed a lot of the time. Did you write like during the day at work, lunchtime? And um, I'd rather not comment on that. Okay, all right. <laughs> you're no longer on the job, you know. <laughs> um, um, weekends were a good time to write. Okay. Um, you also write wonderful short stories about Australia. I've really enjoyed a number of them in some of the literary anthologies, and where you spent uh, seven years wandering the outback. And in one way, the Australian outback and prison appear to be opposites. You know, one is outdoors and freedom, the other is indoors and confinement. But in what ways are they alike and what is it that attracts you to them? Ironically, Australia started out as a penal colony. Um, That's why you were there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Australia was exciting, especially the northern outback where we were working cattle. Um, so it gave me a raw edge to life. Like I said, I'm pretty much an adventure junkie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got uh, similar kicks out of uh, the excitement of uh, the northern outback of Australia as, as I did working in prison. Because you're, you're using your wits all the time. Um, you're challenged all the time. Mm -hmm. Intellectually and emotionally engaging and challenging. And physically, too. Yeah. Yes. Um, your writing is very strong and descriptive. It's, it's packed with detail. It's almost, it's not, I wouldn't call it dense. That might be off-putting. It's not really dense. It's not hard to read. There's just, every word counts. And it, it's alive with a, so it seems to be a limitless supply of really strong um, verbs and, and adjectives. How do you access this rich resource of language within yourself? Where does this come from? You read. You read voraciously, you read like the wolf feeds. And you have to read everything. 
uh, read Shakespeare, read Milton, read Chaucer, read also the contemporary writers, read Hemingway, read Chekhov, read Tolstoy, read the newspapers, read the journals, read, read everything. And they're really great books. You need to read them more than once because probably in your first reading you're going to assimilate maybe 30% of what the book has to tell you. Um, so there's books I've read probably half a dozen times. When you've read a book to the point where it's as much a part of you as old friends, then you have your resource. Then you're going to make the connections when you're looking for dialogue, when you're looking for metaphors or similes. So you're drawing on the history of, of, of the reading you've done, basically, yeah. that's what you're saying. You, you, you asked me a question um, a while back, where did this statement from Chester come from? Uh, grief must have its limits, sir, if we are to get on with the toils of living. And I thought for a moment, I said, damn, that came from Macbeth, scene five. <laughs> Mourn him not by his worth, or your sorrow will never end. So that's the type of connections you make. And you also are able to recall, and, and you know, it's, uh, there's a photographic memory, and there's a literary memory, I guess, or a language memory, and you seem to have that. Um, just one more question before we close. Um, you've been fiction editor of the Sandho Review for how many years? About five years. About five years. Yeah. What advice would you give to writers who hope to publish short stories in or fiction in literary journals like the Sandho Review? First, you have to hone your craft. You need to read. You need to write a great deal. Probably, you're you're going to need a writer's group um, in order to. Uh, have your blind spots pointed out. When you start out, your writing is going to be highly derivative. Uh, writers start imitating other writers. But you want to get away from that as quickly as possible. You want to find your own voice. Never send an editor what you think he wants to read, because uh, too many journals uh, look as if the same writer has written every story. Never send a publisher what you think he wants to publish. Find your own voice, because if you don't do that, you have nothing. Even if you get published in a major journal, you have nothing. Even if you write a derivative thriller that sells 50,000 copies, you have nothing. Find your own voice, write from the deepest part of you. And um, if you do that and you hone it, at some point, somebody is going to pick it up. Well, and you've had... Yeah. You've had that happen with your stories. That's obviously something you've learned to do and you do well. Um, and you've done it in the siege. Um, that's good advice. That's good, solid advice for people to hear. Um, is there a website where people can learn more about you and your writing and get in touch with you? www.willwriteforfood.org. Of course, I, I may not be writing for food much longer. I hope not. <laughs> But I still like the, the handle. Well, and people can also go to the Sento Review Press yes. website to um, find a link to your book. And of course, it's on Amazon in both the print and Kindle versions. Yes. Um, thank you, James Hanna, for this interview. It's really been a pleasure. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you and appreciate your very descriptive and insightful and educational answers. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much.